Hello, um, I am Jeffrey Cohen. I am the Dean of Humanities in the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, and I'm very happy that you came with us, came to join us tonight to celebrate Natalie Diaz. Someday I aspire to have a woo like that, but I'm working on it. Um, I, I just want to say very briefly that uh, what I, I, I've been here for about seven months now, and one of the things that has really impressed me about ASU, and in fact is one of the main reasons why I was attracted to taking this job, is that the humanities faculty and students are fantastic. Every week I get to know them better and this job to me seems better and better. And tonight in many ways seems like a culmination. I have to say before I took this job, I certainly knew some of the faculty members, some in the English department, some in the sciences, some just scattered around. But one of the people who I felt like had been haunting me previously was in fact Natalie Diaz. And there were two moments when um, her work came pivotally into my life. One, when I was writing a really crazy essay for a journal, and I decided I was going to do it in this really obscure form called the Abecedarian. Now, Abecedarian poems are just ABC poems, and for a long time they were extremely complicated poems. You could do them in multiple languages, but they were, they were not easy to do, and I thought the form had died out. But when I Googled it, I found that Natalie Diaz had actually written an abecedarian poem. I'll read you the title of it. Abecedarian requiring further examination of Anglican seraphim subjugation of a wild Indian reservation. That poem is through the roof. I recently taught it to my desert thinking class and there's nothing like it. So I just thought, all right, I'm just gonna give up on trying that form. She's already been there and done a great job. The next book project that I'm, in fact, I'm working on right now is on a long history of Noah's Ark. Not surprisingly, Natalie Diaz has a poem called It Was the Animals. That poem opens with, today my brother brought over a piece of the ark wrapped in a white plastic grocery bag. It seems like I can't go anywhere without finding her there first um, and writing these beautiful, intricate poems. Well, you'll hear some of those tonight. It is not um, my honor to be able to introduce her. In fact, tonight I'm introducing Tito Rios, who will then introduce Natalie Diaz. Tito Rios, as many of you know, is the inaugural poet laureate of the state of Arizona. He is the director of the Virginia G. Piper Center for Creative Writing. Uh, spent his life growing up in Nogales, writes about the borderlands, also a poet whose work I had known before I came here and I couldn't believe that I get to work with him. As way of introduction to him, and I say this as someone who gets to meet with him every other week in his role as director of the Creative Writing Center, I simply want to read you a couple of lines that I think capture the best of what his poetry can do and also what a good person he is. This is the ending of one of my favorite poems that Tito's written. It's called A House Called Tomorrow. It end, it's a meditation on what each of us brings into the world and the possibilities we bring with us. And this is what he writes. If someone in your family tree was trouble, a hundred were not. The bad do not win, not finally, no matter how loud they are. We simply would not be here if that were so. You are made fundamentally from the good. With this knowledge, you never march alone. You are the breaking news of the century. You are the good who has come forward. Let me now call forward Tito Rios. Thank you, Jeffrey. Thank you, everybody. Welcome, everybody. Bienvenidos todos. What a wonderful night. This is Natalie Diaz's night, but I will tell you, and some of you I know have been here long enough to remember uh, an afternoon, an Arizona winter late afternoon, much like this one, many years ago, when Rita Dove was teaching here and she had just won the Pulitzer Prize. We had a ceremony, a celebration, much like we're having today, and today it feels like a passing of the torch and what wonderful, what a wonderful, wonderful circumstance that is and how lucky we are here at Arizona State University to participate in making 
the arts. We are participants in that endeavor, and I'm proud to say that. Natalie Diaz was born and raised in the Fort Mojave Indian Reservation, uh, Indian Village in Needles, California, on the banks of the Colorado River. She is Mojave and an enrolled member of the Gila River Indian Tribe. Her first poetry collection, When My Brother Was an Aztec, was published by Copper Canyon Press. I want to say that's one of the most important first books in contemporary poetry. That book, I think, has changed some, yes. I think that's totally fair, and I think it's really forward-thinking of Copper Canyon Press to publish so many writers writing in the vein that, that, uh, that uh, Natalie has found. Um, she is a, as we have heard, a 2018 MacArthur Foundation Fellow, but she, she is also a Lannan Literary Fellow and a Native Arts Council Foundation Artist Fellow. She was awarded a Breadloaf Fellowship, the Holmes National Poetry Prize, a Hotter Fellowship, and a Penn Sibitiella Ranieri Foundation Residency, as well as being awarded a U.S. Artists Ford Fellowship. She teaches here at Arizona State University in the Creative Writing Program, where she is the Maxine and Jonathan Marshall Chair in Modern and Contemporary Poetry. That's the official bio on Natalie. I read it all because she earned it all. We can skip through these things and we can make introductions shorter, but our lives get shorter in doing that. She has earned every step of the way. She is, in some, a force of nature. Uh, there are currently in the world about 6,500 languages. About 2,000 of them have 100 or fewer speakers. Something worth noticing, worth mentioning that is not in the official bio, and may, maybe Natalie will talk a little bit about it tonight, is she is, has been involved in helping the Mojave people preserve their language. Language, after all, is a blueprint of culture. It's who we are, who we've been, what we remember, where we're going, what we eat, things that are intrinsic to us personally as a people. And if it is a small group who is speaking that language, we are in danger of losing one view of the world equal to all other views. That is so meaningful, that work with the Mojave people. I'm glad she's doing it. Uh, I also want to say I got to interview her for Books and Company a little while back. And I want to say one thing about the book, uh, when my brother was an Aztec. I was so wonderfully surprised to hear her talk about a tarantula migration. I thought I was the only person growing up in Arizona who would ever seen thousands and thousands of tarantulas coming through my neighborhood. People always thought I was making that up. I pass that baton now to Natalie. Natalie, welcome. I just noticed um, one of my high school teachers is here uh, from River Valley. Um, gracias. Gracias por venir. Um, it's, it's my luck, I mean, for so many reasons, it's my luck to be uh, just sharing this night with you. Um, I don't usually get nervous for these things, and I am now, um, but I, I think that probably just means that I love you. You know, so there's a different uh, pressure, I think, when, when you're reading to people, um, you know, people you love, uh, people you've been in exchange with, um, people who, who mean a lot to you. Um, thank you, Jeffrey and uh, Tito, Maestro. Um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of what I have been able to do is, is possible because of the things that Tito has done. Um, Yes, I was a Copper Canyon author, but he was there making space so that my book had a place to land. Um, but I do, ha I, the one thing about the, the tarantula migration, if he's, if he's using me to validate that, like, I just made that up. I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not even sure it happens. Um, I want to acknowledge 
the Atham and, and Pipash people whose lands we're on, my people. Um, do we have any, any Atham or Pipash? Yeah. Be careful, we might, we might own this, play, this room by the end of the night. We're gonna have a vote. Um, I'm, actu I'm actually going to read um, some, some newer poems. Um, but something I, I wanted just to talk about first is uh, why poetry is something I've been talking with my students. My students are, are here. Um, a lot of what I've been able to do here at ASU has been because of my students. Um, the leaps they're willing to take with me and the, the ways they push me to take larger leaps and to ask bigger questions. Um, uh, but, you know, poetry is, is one of those things that we tend to think of existing in a, a separate space from most things we do. Um, but I really truly believe in the power of language. The way I was taught about language is that it's an energy. It's something moving, it's something physical. Um, and it's also something prophetic. Um, you know, it, if you can say it, you can do it. If you can say it, you can become it, for better and worse. And something my students and I were talking about this evening that I would just like us to kind of think about as, as I'm reading these is, you know, why poetry for me is because I'm really interested in this question lately. Like, what is the language we need to live right now? What is the language, like if we could each ask ourselves that question, what is the language I need to live right now? And then to think about what that language might be. What does it mean to, to have language that makes me visible and someone else invisible? Or what does it mean to, to, to say something that suddenly gives me possibility or somebody else possibility? What does it mean to speak, speak language that brings with it joy and not just pain? And the other question that I would like us to consider um, as, I'm, as I'm reading and, and as we're, we're here kind of exchanging this energy, and again, this is a question my students and I spoke about this evening, what am I a part of? What is it that each one of us sitting in this room right now feels like we are a part of? Like, what does it mean that we are all here in this room together? You know, some of you were dragged here, you know, by a couple instructors who, you know, who I paid well. <laughs> but but in, in reality, what, is, what does it mean that we are a part of this small group who's in this room? When we leave this room, what other, what other things are we a part of? You know, and that's something I think a lot about, is that poetry for me, the least of it is what is happening on my page. The least of poetry is what I wrote on the page. That, that's only where it begins. Um, and so if you can just kind of think along with me as we move through these, um, these poems. American arithmetic. Native Americans make up less than 1% of the population of America, 0.8% of 100%. Oh, mine efficient country. I do not remember the days before America. I do not remember the days when we were all here. Police kill Native Americans more than any other race. Race is a funny word. Race implies someone will win, implies I have as good a chance of winning as who wins the race that isn't a race? Native Americans make up 1.9% of all police killings, higher per capita than any race, and we exist as 0.8% of all Americans. Sometimes race means run. I'm not good at math. Can you blame me? I've had an American education. We are Americans and we are less than 1% of Americans. We do a better job of dying by police than we do existing. When we are dying, who should we call? The police or our senator? Please, someone, call my mother. 
At the National Museum of the American Indian, 68% of the collection is from the United States. I am doing my best to not become a museum of myself. I am doing my best to breathe in and out. I am begging, let me be lonely but not invisible. But in an American room of 100 people, I am Native American, less than one, less than whole. I am less than myself, only a fraction of a body. Let's say I am only a hand. And when I slip it beneath the shirt of my lover, I disappear completely. Sometimes that statistic is 1.8. Um, I don't know that that, uh, that changes it a whole lot. Catching copper. My brothers have a bullet. They keep their bullet on a leash, shiny as a whip of blood. My brothers walk their bullet with a limp, a clipped hip bone. My brother's bullet is a math head, is all geometry. From a distance is just a bee and its sting. Like a bee, you should see my brother's bullet make a comb by chewing holes in what is sweet. My brothers lose their bullet all the time. When their bullet takes off on them, their bullet leaves a hole. My brothers search their houses, their bodies for their bullet, and a little red ghost moans. Eventually, my brothers call out, here, bullet, here. Their bullet comes running, buzzing. Their bullet always comes back to them. When their bullet comes back to them, their bullet leaves a hole. My brothers are too slow for their bullet because their bullet is in a hurry and wants to get the lead out. My brother's bullet is dressed for a red carpet in a copper jacket. My brothers tell their bullet, careful you don't hurt somebody with all that flash. My brothers kiss their bullet in a dark cul-de-sac in front of the corner store ice machine in the passenger seat of their car on a strobe lighted dance floor. My brother's bullet kisses them back. My brothers break and dance for their bullet. The jerk, the stanky leg, they pop, lock, and drop for their bullet. A move that has them writhing on the ground. The worm, my brothers call it. Yes, my brothers go all worm for their bullet. My brother's bullet is registered, is a bullet of letters, has a PD, a CIB, a GSW, if they are lucky, an EMT, if not, a triple nine, a DNR, a DOA. My brothers never call the cops on their bullet and instead pledge allegiance to their bullet with hands over their hearts and stomachs and throats. My brothers say they would die for their bullet. If my brothers die, their bullet would be lost. If my brothers die, there's no bullet to begin with. The bullet is for living brothers. My brothers feed their bullet the way the bulls fed Zeus, burning on a pyre, their own thigh bones wrapped in fat. My brothers take a knee, bow against the asphalt, prostrate on the concrete for their bullet. We wouldn't go so far as to call our bullet a prophet, my brothers say. But my brother's bullet is always lit like a night church. It makes my brothers holy. You could say my brother's bullet cleans them, the way red ants wash the empty white bowl of a dead coyote's eye socket. Yes, my brother's bullet cleans them, makes them ready for God. Something I think a lot about um, is our ideas of goodness and, and the ways that we, the ways that we've, we pretend that goodness is an actual thing. You know, it, it's, it's kind of like logic, it's, it's kind of like law. I grew up thinking that 
that the law was good. If you followed the law, you were good, nothing bad would happen to you. Um, and it didn't take long for me to realize that's not, that's not the way law works. Law is another system of control. Logic is another system of control. And so goodness is something that I, I really have struggled with in my life to think, what does it mean to be good? Especially because it was that idea of goodness that let me be me and not my brother. I knew that I had to be the best at everything. I was the best at basketball, I was the best in school, because I knew that's what I, I had to do that to leave the place that I was. And sometimes I think to myself, like, why wasn't it my brother who's sitting, who's standing here reading these poems to you? And why am I not home on my reservation, you know, suffering from some of the things he suffers? And so this poem is, is my way of, of kind of questioning that. You need a little bit of, of musical background, though. Um, especially because now as I get older, I realize my students' uh, frame of res reference is not always mine, so. Um, does anyone know the group, the Yeah, Yeah, Yeahs? All right, a couple of you, some of you vintage listeners. For those of you who don't, I'm going to play a little clip for you. So that song is called Maps. And she's saying, you know, wait, they don't love you like I love you. Um, and then the most famous sampler of, of our late age, Beyonce lifted a few lines from that. So you get kind of the idea. They don't love you like I love you. My mother said this to me long before Beyonce lifted the lyrics from the yeah, yeah, yeahs. And what my mother meant by don't stray was that she knew all about it, the way it feels to need someone to love you, someone not your kind someone white, some one, some many, who live only because so many of mine have not, and further live on top of those of ours who don't. I'll say, 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 I'll say, 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 what is America if not a cloud, if not spilled milk or blood, if not the place we once were in the millions America is maps. Maps are ghosts, white and not fully themselves, see-through. My mother, like your mother, has always known best, knew that I've been begging for them to lay my face against their white laps, to be held in something more than their mirror, the projector of themselves, they flicker sepia or blue all over my body. All this time, I thought my mother said, wait, as in give them a little more time to know your worth, when really she said, wait, meaning heft, preparing me for the yoke of myself, the beast of my country's burdens, which is less worse than my country's plow. Yes, when my mother said, they don't love you like I love you, she meant, Natalie, that doesn't mean you're not good. I 
I see some of my undergrads back there. Two incredible poets are hanging out in the back. I also have some like happy poems. <laughs> um, are there any uh, are there any basketball players? You know, yeah. All right. I knew all the res people would raise their hand over there. Yeah. The great thing about res ball, especially out this way, is you don't have to like run the full court. You just like kind of stay in the middle and you run to the, the three-point line and you just launch them and then you run back to the other three-point line and you know hopefully you've got a fast person and I know yeah I know that that kind of ball. This poem is called Run and Gun. I, I'm still at that point in my life where I've been a basketball player for longer than I have not been. Um, and, and basketball was the way that I knew I was going to leave where I was. Um, it, for me, it was like, you know, it, like James Baldwin says, it was my gimmick. It was a thing that I knew could catapult me to someplace else. And again, it was as part of the way I exercised those ideas of goodness, is that I became that gimmick. Um, and basketball was all I thought about for many years of my life. Run and gun. I learned to play ball on the res, on outdoor courts where the sky was our ceiling. Only a tribal kid shot has an arc made of sky. We balled in the res park against a tagged backboard with a chain for a net, where I watched a wallopie boy from Peach Springs dunk the ball in a pair of flip flops and slip on the slick concrete to land on his wrist. His radius fractured and ripped up through his skin like a tusk, which didn't stop him from pumping his unhurt arm into the air and yelling, Yeah, Clyde the Glide, motherfuckers, before some adult sped him off to the emergency room. I ran games in the abandoned schoolyard with an eight-foot fence we had to hop, where I tore so many pairs of shorts on the top spikes, and where when my little brother got snagged trying to climb down, my cousin and I let him hang by the waistband of his underwear for an entire game of 11. And if that cousin hadn't overdosed on heroin a few years later, he might have proved us right and been the first res jump man. I got run by my older brother on our slanted driveway, the same brother I write about now, who taught me that there is nothing easy in our desert, who blocked every shot I ever took against him until I was about 12 years old. By then, his addictions had stolen his game. I learned the game with my brothers and cousins, with my friends and enemies. We had jacked up shoes and mismatched socks. Our knees were scabbed and we licked our lips chapped. We were small, but we learned to play big enough to beat the bigger, older white kids at the rec center on the hill, which to get to we crossed underneath the I-40 freeway across the train tracks and through a big sandy wash. We played bigger and bigger until we began winning. And we won by doing what all Indians before us had done against their opponents. We became coyotes and rivers. And we ran faster than their fancy kicks could up and down the court. Game after game, we became the weather. We blew by them. We rained buckets. We lit up the gym with our moves. We learned something that was more important than fist. At least at that age, we learned to make guns of our hands, and we pulled the trigger on jumpers all damn day. And when they talked about the way we played, they called it run and gun, and it made them tired before they ever stepped on the court. Just thinking about a pickup game against us made the white boys from the junior high and high school teams go to sleep. And while they slept, we played like dreams. Um, I'm, most poets are, but I'm really uh, interested in etymologies, and so I spend a lot of time. Um, I spend a lot of time in the OED, so this has a not quite an epigraph, but there's a, a, a script at the top that says uh, "Alacran Scorpion Cut," um, 
I was trying to trace the, the Spanish word for scorpion and it led me back to Sanskrit. Um, and one of, the, one of the lenses on how that word came about had to do with cut. Bloodlight. My brother has a knife in his hand. He has decided to stab my father. This could be a story from the Bible if it wasn't already a story about stars. I weep a la cranes. The scorpions clatter to the floor like yellow metallic scissors. They land upside down on their backs and eyes, but writhe and flip to their segmented bellies. My brother has forgotten to wear shoes again. My scorpions circle him, whip at his heels. In them is what stings in me. It brings my brother to the ground. He rises, still holding the knife. My father ran out of the house, down the street, crying like a lamplighter. But nobody turned their lights on. It is dark. The only light left is in the scorpions. There is a small light left in the knife, too. My brother now wants to give me the knife. Some might say my brother wants to stab me. He tries to pass it to me like it is a good thing, like don't you want a little light in your belly, like the way Orion and Scorpius across all that black night pass the sun. My brother loosens his mouth between his teeth throbbing red Antares. One way to open a body to the stars with a knife, one way to love a sister, help her bleed light. I say the word white a lot, um, and it, I mean, it has a, lot of, uh, has a lot of currency on my reservation. But I also realize the discomfort that causes in people. Um, and it's, it's always interesting to me that as I'm, when I say white, I mean, I've, I've been called by color my whole life and different variations of it. But it, it's always interesting that when I look out, if I say white and I meet the eyes of of someone who might consider themselves white, they immediately look away. Um, and so I'm interested in that. I'm interested in the ways we think about whiteness. And like, I don't even know uh, what that means. Like this poem came, up, came out of that, came out of this kind of blanket description, you know, that we, we kind of say like whiteness. Um, and I, to me, that's one of the, that's the laziest place to stop. Like, like that's just the beginning, like, you know, um, it, it's not a place where we can say, oh, this is about whiteness. Like, no, it's about, it's about all of us, you know. And, and to me, this is one of the most compelling things about living here in Phoenix, living in Arizona. This is one of the most complex places that exists. Like, right now, we are on the grounds of, of indigenous peoples. Some of these peoples were my people. Some of these peoples were your peoples. Like, we're right on top of that ground. Um, and, and what's interesting to me is like the amount of tension that a place like this can hold is incredible. And it's also what makes this place, um, it gives us so much possibility, you know, that, that we might all be here stuck in this pressure and yet we need one another to develop a new language, a language that works, a language that acknowledges each one of us and a language is, that's going to allow us all to have a type of futurity. Uh, I don't believe in reparations. Like, there is absolutely no way that this country can make up for 700 years of what it's done. Um, and yet, here we all are. And each one of us deserves, like, the fullness of, of a life, the autonomy of, of pleasure, the autonomy, you know, that we've denied each other for so long. And so, this poem is... This poem is going deeper into it than I've been in some of the other poems. Even the poems that seem like, oh, she's dealing with this, it's very much about race, but this poem is doing something a little bit different. Um, but that's where it came about, like me trying to question this and trying to wonder about what does it mean that I am, I'm indigenous? What does it mean that I'm queer? What does it mean that I'm Latina? Um, 
and, and what am I allowed of, of autonomy? Am I allowed pleasure? Am I allowed tenderness? Am, am I allowed, or I am only allowed to be the object of, of those things for somebody else? Like church, my lover comes to me like dark fall, long and through my open window, mullion, transom. A good window lets the outside participate. I keep time on the hematite clocks of her shoulders, and I've done so much of it. Time. Her right hip bone is a searchlight, sweeping me, finds me. I've only ever escaped through her body. What if we stopped saying whiteness so it meant anything? For example, if you mean milk of magnesia, say milk of magnesia, or snow, or they've hurt another one of us, or the way the quarter moon is a smoke atop the dirty water, or the purling damp she laces up my throat, my face, mi caracol. They think brown people fuck better when we are sad, like horses or coyotes, all hoof or howl, all mouth clamped down in the hair on the neck, slicked with latherin. You ask, who is they? Even though you know, you want me to name names. Shoot, we're named after them. You think my creator had ever heard of the word Natalie? Ha, when he first named me, he called me Snake, then promised the afterlife would be reversed. South turned north, full with tight watermelons. Pluck one melon, and one melon grows in its place. But it's hard, isn't it? not to perform what they say about our sadness when we are always so sad. It is real work to not perform a fable. Just ask the turtle, ask the hare. Remind yourself and your friends, sometimes I feel fast, sometimes I am so slow, sometimes I get put down in the street. Always I win the wound they hang on my chest. Remind yourself, your friends, they are only light because we are dark. And if we didn't exist, it wouldn't be long before they had to invent us, like the light switch. Yes, our creator says kingdom and we come. Remind our friends, we fuck like we church, best, and full of God and joy and sins and sweet upside down cake. And when they ask me what's in your love's eyes, I tell them, wild watermelons, green on green striped, she and I, we eat the watermelon, starting at its thick sugar heart, hold the beady seeds in our mouths like new eyes, and wait for them to leap open and see us first. I'll read a couple more. My mother would be so upset if she knew I said the F word with church. <laughs> luckily, she, luckily she, they, don't, they don't come to these things, so. Um, I'm, gonna read, I'm gonna read this poem for a few of, of my, my students who I should be referring to as poets. Um, I, have a, I have really bad anxiety. Um, I think it's probably one of the reasons why I played basketball. Um, and it's something that I think a lot of people don't notice on the outside right away. It's something I've learned to, I've learned to handle in many different ways. So I have all of these like strategies that I use, but, but it's, it's a lot of energy and work for me to, to do some of the things um, because of this anxiety. And, you know, I know that, you know, I've had a lot of conversations with some of my students and I know that, you know, we're always trying to, we're, we're always trying to find a way to not let it like control us in the ways that it does and and for me this poem was about me trying to say what might happen if I called it something else you know I claim to believe in this power of language I, I claim to believe that that language can can be prophetic so what if I what if instead of treating anxiety like this dark hook in me what if I decided to treat it as a beloved um, as something that that I might have some sort of relationship with. 
I don't know that it's actually worked yet, but this poem was my first attempt at it. Um, I still had to take a Xanax before I got up here. <laughs> From the desire field. I don't call it sleep anymore. I'll risk losing something new instead. Like you lost your rosen moon, shook it loose. But sometimes when I get my horns in a thing, a wonder, a grief, or a line of her, it is a sticky and ruined fruit to unfasten from, despite my trembling. Let me call my anxiety desire then. Let me call it a garden. Maybe this is what Lorca meant when he said, verde, que te quiero verde. Because when the shade of night comes, I am a field of it, of any worry ready to flower in my chest. My mind in the dark is una bestia, unfocused, hot, and if not yoked to exhaustion beneath the hip and plow of my lover, then I am another night wandering the desire field, bewildered in its low green glow, belling the meadow between midnight and morning. Insomnia is like spring that way, surprising and many-petaled, the kick and leap of gold grasshoppers at my brow. I am struck in the witched hours of want. I want her green life, her inside me in a green hour I can't stop. Green vein in her throat, green wing in my mouth, green thorn in my eye. I want her like a river goes, bending, green, moving, green, moving. Fast as that, this is how it happens. Soy una sonambula. And even though you said today you felt better, and it is so late in this poem, is it okay to be clear, to say, I don't feel good? To ask you to tell me a story about the sweet grass you planted and tell it again or again until I can smell its sweet smoke, leave this thrashed field and be smooth. And I'll end on this last poem. This is an ode. It, this is a, an old, oldie but goodie poem. Um, but this is for, this is for all the people out there with hips. We're always told we have to hide them, but I think I, um, I got more Mojave hip than I did Atham hip, but. Um, And uh, gracias just for being here tonight. It, I mean, it's such a lucky um, a thing, you know, any time just to gather, I think, and, and to share language with people. And, you know, poetry for me is, it feels a lot like story. Um, but also to celebrate this thing that, you know, it, it's, the MacArthur is a strange thing uh, because people, like, look at you as if, like, oh, you did this thing, and it's, it's all about you, and, and it's, it's the complete opposite. Like, I have had the, I, I've been the luckiest person in terms of the people I've met along the way. I mean, my first, my first interaction with ASU was that I was recruited to play basketball here. Um, there was a different coach, Charlie, coach, you know, Charlie wasn't here at that time. She had recruited me to play NAU, but the altitude was so high, I couldn't breathe when I got up there, so I was like, I'm not going. But that was my first interaction with, with ASU. And then many years later, you know, I had gone back east to play basketball. I went overseas to play. Um, I came back kind of desperate. I, I knew I needed to help my community, um, you know, do what we could to, to save our language. Save is such a, a hard word to use. Um, and I had no idea how to do it or where to start. Um, and so the first place I went um, was the Center for Indian Education. And I met Terry McCarty and I met Dr. Brian Brayboy. Um, and that, the way they opened their, like one ASU to me, but also just their, their you know, their hearts and, and you know, their, their wonders and the way they thought about the world and about language. I mean, it changed, it changed me completely. Um, my life would be a different life, and I wouldn't be the person I am had I not done that language work. Um, I'm, I'm, such, I'm so much more than I ever could have been without it. Um, 
And so I really appreciate just you all sharing this with me because, I mean, really all this is is, is like a small reflection of the many people who, you know, have shared conversation with me, who have shared ideas with me along the way. And, um, you know, I just happened to be the one the people in the room thought about that day. But there are so many of us here, I think, that, um, you know, I am glad I got the money and not you, but... Um, <laughs> So I'll end on this poem. It's a, it's an ode. So it's you know enjoy it if you, if you feel it in your hips, you feel free to move your hips. Um, it might rain outside after that. I'm not sure. We'll see what happens. Um, ode to the beloved's hips. Bells are they shaped on the eighth day? Silvered percussion in the morning are the morning. Swing, switch, sway, hold the day away. A little longer, a little slower, a little easy. Call to me, I wanna rock, I, I wanna rock, I, I wanna rock right now. So to them I come, struck dumb, chime blind, tolling with a throat full of Hosanna. How many hours bowed against this infinity of blessed trinity? Communion of pelvis, sacrum, femur, my mouth, terrible angel, everlasting novena, ecstatic devourer. Oh, the places I have laid them, knelt and scooped the amber fast honey from their openness. A muzen cob's hidden temple of Tulum, licked smooth the sticky of her hip. Heat thrummed osa coxy, lambent slave to ilium and ischium. I never tire to shake this wild hive. Split with thumb the sweet dripped comb, hot hexagonal hole, dark diamond to its nectar dervished queen. May nad tongue come drunk, hum tranced honey puller. For her hips, I am strummed, song, and succubus. They are the sign, hip, and the cosine, a great book, the body's Bible opened up to its good news gospel. Alleluia's, Ave Maria's, Madre Mia's, Ay, Ay, Ay's, Ay Dios Mio's, and hip, hip, hooray. Cult of Cossacks, culto de cadera, oracle of orgasm, Rorschach's riddle. What do I see? Hips, innominate bone, wishbone, orpheus bone, transubstantiation bone, hips of bread, wine wet thighs, say the word and healed I shall be. Bone butterfly, bone wings, bone ferris wheel, bone basin, bone throne, bone lamp, apparition in the bone grotto, sixth mystery, slick rosary bead, deme la gracia of a decade in this garden of carmine flower, exile me to the enormous orchard of Alcinus, spiced fruit, laden tree, in paradise me, because God, I am guilty. I am sin frenzied and full of teeth for pear upon apple upon fig. More than all that are your hips. They are a city, they are kingdom. Troy, the hollowed horse, a legion of desire. Thirty soldiers in the belly, two in the mouth. Beloved, your hips are the war. At night, your legs love our boulevards, leading me beggared and hungry to your candy house, your Baroque mansion, even when I am late and the tables have been cleared in the kitchen of your hips, let me eat cake. O oh, constellation of pelvic glide, every curve, a luster, a star, more infinite still, your hips are cosmic, our universe, galactic carousel of burning comets and big, big bangs. Millennium Falcon, let me be your hero. O oh, hot planet, let me circumambulate. O oh, spiral galaxy, I am coming for your dark matter. Along las calles de tus muslos I wander. Follow the parade of pulse like a drumline. Descend into your Plaza del Toros. Hands throbbing miura bulls, dark isleros. Your arched hips, I mi torera. Down the long corridor, your wet walls lead me like a traje de luces. All glitter, glowed, I am the animal born to rush your rich red muletas. Each breath, each sigh, each groan, a hooked horn of want. My mouth at your inner thigh. Here I must enter you, mi pobre manolete. Press and part you like a wound. Make the crowd pounding in the grandstand of your iliac crest rise up in you and cheer. Gracias.
that, you, that's crazy. You didn't have to do that. Um, <laughs> Um, yeah, I can, we'll do, you know, Q&As are always a gamble <laughs> when, you're, uh, when you're a native or when you're a Latina. Um, but if anyone has, I'm, I'm, I'm totally open for a couple questions if anybody has them. Definitely all right if, you're, if you don't too. What yeah. do you mean you made up the tarantulas? Oh, no. My, my father saw the tarantulas, so it was my father who told me about them. So, Tito, uh, yeah regains his uh, truthfulness, so, yeah. Oh, yeah, there's a question. Um, have I always been a writer? I, I've probably always been a little bit of a liar, which is, you know, like, I grew up with stories. My mom tells ghost stories. Like, um, we were a really big family, so, you know, we were one of those families who had, like, two TV channels. And one was like Arizona PBS. And then the other one, like, it looked, I thought it was snowing like everywhere else in the world because there was so much snow in all of our television, you know, stations. Um, but yeah, I think I've always just loved words. I grew up around language. I grew up around a language that was kept from me in a way. So, um, you know, I was really close with my great grandmother who spoke Mojave. Um, and, you know, uh, she was like one of my best friends growing up and and I I just watched like they kind of kept it for me like so they would speak in it but you know when I would come in the room they would stop or they would shut the door when they talked um, and I don't know I think we're probably all writers in a way you know like we all have we all have stories for sure um, but it I do realize that it's a complete luxury that I get to do what I do. Like, you know, I tell my students all the time, like, there's like a world that's burning down around us in some ways, and there's a world that's also like, you know, springing with life and joy, but the fact that I get to stop for any period of time in a day, even if it's just the length of a poem, and to suddenly, like, feel my body, and to be, to be a self of some sort, um, you know, or to ask a, a question that doesn't need an answer. Um, it, it's pretty lucky. So um, I, I think there's, we are probably all writers, yeah, in a way. Are you a writer? Yeah, yeah. That's a, yeah. Uh-oh, interesting. That was a key, that's a buzzword right there. The you go basketball, as you think, you better play. As you know, a lot of kids in the hood also buy basketball, so, where did that notion come from that basketball for you to get from the edge? Yeah, well, so when I mentioned it in regard to Baldwin, Baldwin talks about, um, he was talking about um, the, the young black man in Harlem. And so he was just saying that uh, you could have the church, which was his gimmick, he considered the black church his gimmick, or you could go into entertainment at that time. And now we see it, you know, we see what, what's happening to the, the, the black body in particular, but the black and brown body um, in ways that, you know, a very Coliseum-like behavior. It's like you can, part, you can perform your body, just don't think too much while you're doing it, you know. Uh, for me, the, the reason why basketball was the thing is because it was a thing that let me shut everything else out. Um, it was like, you know, I could just leave my house. I could leave as soon as the sun came up and, and just all I needed was a ball. We didn't have to have fancy shoes. You know, uh, we didn't need a net. And it was, it was the thing we all did just to be ourselves. Um, and I was good at it. And I, I learned to, you know, to be better at it. Um, but I think we all have a gimmick, right? Like sometimes it's, it's the way we're taught to, to think about, you know, how smart we are. Or you know, some of us have you know these different talents, but but even like me standing here is a bit of a gimmick. You know, like um, I was one of two Native women and one of two Latina women who who received the MacArthur. Um, and so in some ways, like when you all come in and see me, I'm I'm performing in a way a little bit of a gimmick. I'm you know I'm making certain jokes about indigeneity. I'm I'm making certain jokes you know that make people comfortable slash uncomfortable. Um, so, so yeah, basketball and was, was one thing and, um, 
you know, I, the, the crazy thing is I learned it from my brother and it wasn't enough to leap him someplace else, but it was for me. Yeah. Yes. Uh, oh yeah, the poet and basketball player. There are actually more poets who are athletes than you would think, but, um, oh, pardon, I got you next. Um, but I actually, I blew my knee out and uh, I was doing rehab at the university I, I played at and so I was training and my professors thought I was a writer before I did and so they talked me into taking some courses while I was rehabbing. Um, and I, I loved it and in a way I think writing and basketball are very much the same. They, you know, they're both physical things to me, they're both about the future. You know, basketball you have to think two steps ahead and writing you're writing toward a futurity you know, even if you're thinking about what has happened and carrying it with you. Um, but yeah, I, I think they're pretty similar, so, yeah. Christine? Chris, gracias. This is an incredible woman. Um, yeah, I'm glad you're here with us. Gracias. Um, uh, yeah, uh, who in here, you know, who in here writes about family? It's the hardest thing to do. You know, like, it, you could tell people the truth and they would never believe it, you know? And so it's a place where your imagination and your emotional imagination has to be even more hyperbolic or more willing to, like, to take these leaps into these places. But something I learned really early on is, early on in writing is that I, I don't know how to love my brother off the page. Uh, I, I feel it in my face when I say that. Um, I, I don't. I, I, it's been a very long time since I've embraced him physically in real life. Um, but on the page is one place that I, I found a, a way, you know, maybe not the best way, but it's a way that I can love him and I can hold him and sometimes just holding someone with language has to be enough, you know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, please. How I learned to read. I was like a pain in the butt for my mom. So I could read when I was like three. And I don't even, my mom like would tell us stories, but she would go shopping at this place called Claypool's that had like a downstairs discount store. And they had all of these like, I don't know if you remember those little like, they, they were kind of expensive like yellow workbooks, like so you could do math or reading or all these things. And I would just sit down there and go through them while she was like shopping. Like so the lady at the counter would keep an eye on me. Um, but I don't know, I don't, I don't remember how. Um, my father actually doesn't, doesn't read really. He has a really tough time reading. Um, and so, yeah, and so that's always been interesting. And, and what's beautiful about that is that he, he, he tries to write now. He wants to write. And so he's always writing these little poems uh, to me. And, and yeah, it was like something, a gift, I guess, my mother gave me for, for story that somehow translated into text. Um, yeah. Yeah. Any, Yeah, when, when do I write or what sparks inspiration? I mean, I, just think about all the, way, all the things that interest you, right? You know, or the things that, um, I feel like anything. I, I mean, I don't believe in like writer's block. Like, I'll just go to the OED and sit in there and, and read, you know, words all day. Like, sometimes that's all, all it takes for me. Um, but I, I think a lot about questions. Like, I, I don't even know what language means half of the time. Like, but I, but I need to know or I want to know. Um, but sometimes it's just a question like, you know, we mentioned this a little bit in class today, but I think a lot of what I'm doing right now, like writing love poems, is it's me making myself possible. 
like, again, like, I say the word pleasure a lot, and it makes, it makes so many people uncomfortable. It's crazy what that word, how it makes people squirm when you say pleasure, you know. Um, but it's not a word we say very often, and I don't understand why. Um, it's, uh, but for me, like, it's important that, that I write myself into those places where I have that autonomy. Like, why should I be desire, like, denied desire? And so for me, a lot of it is about the body of the beloved. And it doesn't have to be a lover, but can I possibly treat a lover the way I treat my sister, the way I treat a friend, the way I treat a stranger? You know, and so that is a question I do bring to the page often is, can everybody on the page be the body of the beloved? Um, and I, I don't know if it can, but that's something I'm, I'm trying to do. Um, yeah. um, I've done like stories and transcriptions, but I, I don't write poetry per se. I do have poems with Mojave in it. Um, that feels like a, a pretty political choice to me. Um, I, I believe that it belongs with my people first for a while. You know, it was taken in a way. Um, and so most of what I write in Mojave is what my elders have asked me to write or things they've told me. Um, yeah, so that's a, I, I'm sure it could change at some, some point in time, but yeah, it feels like a private, intimate thing that uh, I don't, I'm not in a space to share. Yeah, so do you mean, so she was asking, what is your name? Elizabeth. Elizabeth is asking about reparation, like I had said reparation. That's always like a fighting word, like, or to say you don't believe in empathy, my students are realizing that's a fighting word too. Um, but, uh, so do you mean in, in terms of empathy in particular, like so to say I would have this word and I would have this word? Yeah, no, th this is like, that's why, that's why language, I mean, that's why I'm here, I feel like, is that most of our problems are language-based. And I mean, you can see it around, like we're trying to invent all these new words to describe all these things that have been happening for a really long time already, you know? Um, but it's be like language has to shift, I believe. It has to continually shift because we're shifting, you know? So what we're watching is like the diminishment of our English language we're seeing the erasure or crushing of our indigenous languages, you know, but we're also seeing the fight to get those back. And we're seeing our young people, like for, this is a great example. Our young people who are learning languages are now charged with creating new words to describe the things in their life that didn't exist for their, the, the elders who learned, you know, who learned it from another speaker. Um, and I think that's, that's possibility, right? That's futurity, you know? And we have that capability, but we're so afraid to, uh, we're so afraid to grow. Like, so we come projecting. So like, if I just said, I don't believe in reparations, but several of you were like pushing back, like, no, I, I, I'm here and I came here and I'm projecting, I do believe in reparations. So suddenly you would never hear what I, what I say, you know? Um, but also like, bringing up the idea of reparation is, is interesting to me. Like, I would love to have a conversation. Like, like what then is the word, you know, that we would use? Um, and that's why I think poetry is so important, is because it's concerned with every single word. That's why I think the humanities is one of the most important thing. Like, language carries one body to another. And it's the most intimate and physical way of communicating. It's, it's a type of touch, I think, you know? Um, but yeah, that's, I mean, that's the, I think the always question is like, what are the words we need to use? And, and also like, who are those words erasing? You know, who are those words uh, making possible? Who are those words, you know, making impossible? Yeah, so. 
So we, we have an ASU humanities tradition of giving the last question of the night to an ASU student who has never had the opportunity to ask a question in a forum like this. So if there is an ASU student who would like to have this opportunity to change their own life and ask a question. My mom is here. She's never heard me read before. <laughs> <laughs> I love you, Mom. So this last question in the evening for an ASU student, who would like, who would like to do it? It's your chance. And get extra credit. Comes <laughs> I see someone, yes. Hi, um, I'm one of Professor Rios' students. Um, now to think of a question. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so as um, one of Professor Rios' students, I'm starting to learn more about poetry and um, how listening to other people's stories really helps influence my own writing. So I was wondering if you had any good listening tips, just ways for me to be a better listener, especially when it comes to um, uh, poetry. Yeah, I mean, sometimes, and sometimes my students, we, we wear blindfolds to have our conversations. Um, and sometimes we put our pens down and we put the paper away and we just read the poem out loud and try to like experience it. You know, like there's something about reading that is so connected to knowing that it really shuts you down in a way. You know, like how, how can we read for experience or read for wonder? I think is something interesting. Um, and so, you know, maybe just find someone and, and just read each other poems back and forth. Yeah, I, I think that's one of the luckiest things is to be able just to, you know, to just hear them only. Um, and that's hard because we're also, we have, I'm a visual learner. I'm a, I have to like touch things, you know. Um, so I've had to teach myself to listen better. Um, and also, you know, like what if you, read something or heard something and then didn't have to have an opinion about it afterward. But you just said, I'm going to take that with me and see what it does in me for the next hour or tonight or in the morning. Um, and that's the hardest thing I think about reading is, you know, this is my, I could go on and on about ocular centrism, but I won't. But like, you know, reading is a way like we kind of narrow our periphery when we read and so it shuts all this down, and this is where the imagination lives. And so, you know, those would just be a couple thoughts. Like, I, I would be, it would be great, like, if you just throw on, like, an eye mask and have a conversation with one of your, your classmates or your friends and just see what that feels like, you know, to, to not be staring at each other and to not be projecting what you know and, and to not see their facial expressions, but to suddenly say, like, like, hearing is one of the most sensual, you know, um, acts of my body. And, you know, that might be it. But, but thank you for your question. Thank you so much. I, I'm very grateful that you all came out for this. <laughs>